What's up everybody, it's Charles. Today taking your questions on TDI reliability, becoming an apprentice, cleaning carpets, and more. This is episode 251 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. <laughs> All right, if you want to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles, at humblemechanic.com. Put question for Charles in the subject. Ask your question right at the top. Give me some space, then give me the details. That helps me do a better job answering your questions. And if you'd rather listen only to the show, you can, of course, do that in the audio-only podcast available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, or, of course, at humblemechanic.com. All right, let's talk about sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And real quick, if you want to score some awesome discounts as well as get the downloads for the training manuals that I write for the VW Audi classes that I teach, check out that crew membership program, awesome way to support the show, and score discounts to places like Black Forest Eastwood MT Knives. Kerma TDI, USP Motorsports, My Canic Petrol Box, and a whole bunch more. As always, links to that and everything else we're going to talk about today are down in the description. All right, with that wrapped up, let's hit these questions. First one up is from Doug. Looking to buy a post diesel gate 2015 TDI. Not concerned about the emissions components that were fixed during the scandal. Looking more for the overall reliability of the car, and it has a super long extended warranty. I typically keep my cars a long time and put a couple hundred thousand miles on it. I'm mostly concerned about the high pressure fuel pump that's been an issue in the past. Is it better to replace it along with other components at a certain mileage like the timing belt? I guess I'm scared to make the jump from Toyota to Volkswagen, but I'm looking for something more engaging than driving a Camry. All right, Doug, great question. So the 2015 is the only year of that third generation diesel engine. And this is gonna be the same in the Passat and the Golf, Golf Sport Wagon and Jetta. Overall, they have been pretty good. Now, the folks that had it and then got it modified, some have con had concerns of fuel economy coming down, uh, different noises, a weird smell, and uh, extra use of AdBlue. But, Doug, you're totally right. The warranty is insane. Now, you didn't say what car you're looking at, but we just actually got a 2015 Torag diesel, which is an amazing vehicle, and I actually have a... Uh, a controller right here that I may or may not be tuning the vehicle with. We're going to do some testing before we do that. Overall, though, guys, that engine is pretty good. Now, to be fair, there's not a ton of them out there. And also, to be fair, there's not a ton of them with a lot of miles on them. I've seen a handful of repairs, some anomaly-type repairs, like I had one that needed uh, injectors. I think we replaced all four because the car was so new, but it was probably just one that was actually bad. That all came down straight from Volkswagen. What was happening is it was leaking fuel into the crankcase, so the oil level would actually go up, uh, which is fascinating. We thought the customer was just adding oil, but it turns out an injector was leaking. There's really only been one super common repair that I've seen related to the diesel engines, and that's a leaking AdBlue injector. They call it a dosing injector, and it's right next to the coolant bottle on the passenger side under the hood, and it'll get this ball of crystallized goop that collects on top of it. And there was a TSB a while back to replace the line from that location back to the junction just in front of the right rear wheel. And I've also seen some of those actually need the injector as well. Other than that, or workmanship issues with the TDI update, they've been pretty good. Now, you still have all the other issues that you may run into with either a Passat, Jetta, or Golf. The Golf sunroofs are challenging. Uh, the Jetta's pretty good. The Passat, the front rotors are kind of weak. Wheel bearing failure on, on all of them is not uncommon either. That's also not something that you could expect to see on every single vehicle. Overall, I think it's a pretty good car. I think you can still have them at a decent price, not a great price, but a decent price. I've not seen any of those high pressure fuel pumps fail. Now, again, there are not as many of them out there as there were that first generation diesel where we were putting high pressure fuel pumps on them all the time. But if it was the same kind of thing, I think by now, you'd probably see a, a certain number of high pressure fuel pump failures. I'm sure there's been some, but overall, it's not like it was back in that first generation. And I think those pumps are pretty expensive, so I wouldn't make it part of maintenance. On the maintenance thing, that's the biggest thing you can do. Make sure you're using the right engine oil. Make sure you're doing that fuel filter at every 20K maximum. Pollen filter is not nearly as big of a deal, but uh, make sure you, the maintenance is good. That's like the key, right? And you know, one of the keys 
to uh, making sure that your car is going to last a long time. Now, you're moving from Toyota to Volkswagen. You guys know, like, I'm a VW dude, but you can expect to pay more to own that car, that diesel car, than you would a Toyota Camry. Now, even the difference between owning a gas Passat, we'll say, and a diesel Passat, the maintenance is gonna be more on the Passat with the diesel engine, the fuel's more expensive. Guys, right now, I have to say, buying a diesel may not make the most sense in the world. You're paying a premium for the car, you're paying a premium for the fuel, you're paying more for maintenance, and the fuel economy delta is not what it was 15 years ago. The gas engines get pretty darn good fuel economy. So if you're doing it straight up for fuel economy, make sure that you are actually going to save money on fuel economy. Dump it in a spreadsheet and do the math on it. If you're buying it because you want something different, new, a little bit more fun to drive, well, I say go for it. They've been pretty good. We love our diesel Torag. And uh, I know a lot of other people love their diesel Golfs or love their diesel Jettas and, uh, and Passats. But that model year 15, there's not a ton of them out there. And that was the very last year of that diesel engine, thanks to the diesel gate nonsense. All right, next one up is from Cage. Hey, Charles, how are you doing? Love the feed you post on YouTube and Instagram. I have an 07 GTI. Long story short, I was going to a barbecue and some raw meat juice fell on my carpet. Ooh, now the car reeks horribly. I live in Northern California. It's a bit cold right now, so it's not so bad. Would you happen to know any aftermarket upholstery companies that could help? I can go OEM, but I can't find it on the VW website. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for your time. Okay, so if you can't find a part on the VW website, uh, call your local dealership and get a quote from them. Plain and simple. Let's talk a little bit about this. Now, this is, dude, not picking on you. This is really gross. And I've seen a couple things like this over my career. We had a loaner car that someone had, and they spilt milk in the trunk, didn't say anything, didn't clean it up, and what happened is that milk went into the cabin and underneath the back seat, and it was maggots, and ugh, I'm thankful I didn't have to clean this up, but Twitch, I think it was you that had to clean that up, and uh, I, I don't know, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, it's super gross, right? So let's look at what we can do to remedy this issue. I'm going to assume that you've cleaned up at least the surface stuff already, right? That If you haven't, well, do that first. Next, what we wanna probably do is we wanna pull that side carpet up. The cool thing is, is we can just pull one side of the carpet up rather than gutting the interior and taking it all out. Remove the back seat, remove the seat on the side that has the problem, and then you take the door sill trim off and you can peel the carpet up. What we're trying to do is we're trying to evaluate how deep those juices got into that carpet and padding. It's not so much the carpet that's gonna hold that, because guys, that carpet is only about that thick, you know, a handful of maybe half a centimeter thick. It's really, really thin. The issue comes in the padding and sound absorb, uh, sound damper underneath the carpet that will hold that stuff, because that stuff's kind of thick. So we want to pull that carpet up, and we want to evaluate the padding on it. If there is a heavy saturation of padding, we can do a couple of things. If this were my car, I would probably take both seats out, take the center console out, and take the carpet out. Now, if you want to take the carpet out but don't want to pull the dash to open it up, you can make a slit down the center of the carpet that's going to be covered up anyway and just butterfly it and pull it all the way out of the car. You can actually power wash that carpet. It works really, really well. If you have a carpet shampooer, that works good too. But you can power wash it and really scrub that spot to get, to get the stink out. The big thing, though, is we want to evaluate the padding. Again, that's where the stink and the goop is going to be held much more so than in the actual carpet that you see and touch. You can try and clean that padding, same kind of thing, power wash it. Uh, don't go to nuts on it with the, with the sprayer, maybe even just a regular hose rather than a pressure washer or power washer. Make 100% sure that it doesn't stink and that it's dry before you put it back in the car. What I would probably do is I'd let it dry for a couple days because it does take a while to dry. Then I would bring it in an enclosed area and close it in for a day and make sure that when you open that door, it doesn't still stink because I'd hate for you to do all that work and then get it back together and the car still stink. But first thing I would do is I would get that side carpet up if it's like in the middle where the trans tunnel is or something like that, uh, or exhaust tunnel. I'd probably just go ahead and pull it then and make sure that the padding's not goopy. If the padding is bad, you can get just the padding on a lot of these cars. 
and just replace the padding. Either way, I would not wait any longer to do this. The longer that it's in there, you know, that smell can kind of permeate other parts of the car, like the headliner and the pillars and the seats, especially in cloth. So give your local dealer a call, get a price on the carpet, get a price on the padding, just in case so you kind of know the worst case scenario. Uh, but then pull that out. I'm guessing you could probably clean it pretty easily and it won't be too big of a deal. A steam cleaner can help, but you're not going to be able to get to the padding unless you pull that carpet up. And that's the part I'm worried about more so than the really, really thin carpeting itself. So, all right, next one up is from Matt. Hey, Charles, I just got a job as a VW apprentice. I'm enjoying my first week despite occasionally feeling like I was in the way or not being as much help as I'd like to. My experience with engines is entirely industrial, so no need to worry about respecting someone's personal property or making sure things look good when finished. I'm very detail-oriented, so I just have to pace myself whenever given any task, especially any time my mentor, who's a master tech and extremely knowledgeable, tells me to do something on my own. I feel a little bit overwhelmed at times just because I'm learning Elsa Pro system SSPs, new engine parts, and repair processes every day. Though I consistently take as many notes and photos as possible, I guess what I wanted to ask is if there's any specific tips for a new apprentice at a VW dealership. I've already invested in a tool cart, newer tools in addition to bringing many of my applicable tools for my previous occupations. I feel bad that there's many tools I have to constantly ask to borrow, things like impacts and torque wrenches, etc. Thanks for any advice, Matt. Okay, Matt, dude, it sounds like you're off to a real good start. Okay, let's let's break this down. We're gonna work from the bottom up. Talk about tools first. It is your first week. If your mentor expects you to have everything, then you have a bad mentor, okay? You've worked there five days, four days, six days, whatever it is. Uh, of course, you're not gonna have all the tools. So on that front, what I really want you to do is just write a list of all the stuff that you have to borrow. And when you have the money for it, then go ahead and buy it. Of course, an impact tool, whether it's electric or pneumatic, is gonna be pretty high up on the list. A torque wrench is gonna be pretty high up on the list. You don't need to buy that $600 Snap-on or Matco one. I have a couple gear wrench ones that I've been pretty impressed with, so that may be something you wanna look at as well. With an impact gun, if you're gonna buy electric, I love the Milwaukee mid-torque. You can look at the high torque too. It's a little bit heavier, so I like the mid-torque. Ingersoll Rand makes, in my opinion, some of the best pneumatic tools. They're kind of expensive, so you can take yourself down to Harbor Freight and buy one of their, I think, Air Cats or something like that for a hundred bucks. Everybody next to you is going to hate you because it's going to be pretty loud, but it gets the job done and it's only a hundred bucks, so that might be where I would go there. But do not stress about not having every tool you need for this job in your first week. That is how guys get in bad way on the tool truck and rack up a ton of debt that they really, really, really don't need to. I can feel my blood pressure going up just saying those words. So we're gonna move on to the next part. Dude, it sounds like you're off to a great start. First of all, I understand that you've had other careers and things like that. You're still the new guy, it's week one. You can't know everything. You're doing the right things though by taking notes and learning these systems on your own. Once you get your feet wet, once you, we used to say, find where the bathroom is, and that usually takes a couple of weeks, not literally to find where the bathroom is, hopefully anyway, then we can start to worry about, okay, how am I actually doing? If you're not getting screamed at and you're not breaking things and you're taking your time, that is what I always wanted my apprentices to do. Do not worry right now how long something takes you. If your mentor or your service manager or advisor are giving you a hard time about the length of time something takes in your first few weeks, it's time to bounce because that's incredibly irresponsible. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to a customer whose car you're working on. Speed is the last thing I want you to worry about right now. I want you to worry about learning the repair manual, like you said, learning the SSPs. Those things are hard and oftentimes that time to learn those is probably gonna be better spent not trying to do it at the dealership. You know, read an SSP every night before you go to bed or plug through the repair manual while you're eating your lunch and learn where everything is at and how it's organized or how it's disorganized a lot of times. It sounds like you got the skills, right? You're detail oriented, you're taking notes, you're taking pictures, you're trying. And that's the biggest thing, you're trying. As you start to get some experience, then we're gonna start looking at things a little bit differently. Then you're going to get handed a keys to a check engine light diagnosis and the shop foreman's gonna go, all right, let's go and see what you can find. And you're gonna pull faults and you're going to look at technical service bulletins and you're gonna run the guided fault finding. And then you're going to make some notes and you're gonna to go to your mentor and you're gonna say, hey, here's all the things that I did. 
right? Here's all the tests that I ran. Scan tool told me to ran, uh, run. Repair manual said to check. What do you think the next best step is? Rather than, hey man, I got a code. What's wrong with the car, right? Those are the kind of things that used to really tick me off. Putting in no effort and expecting me to just give an answer. That's how you earn your spot uh, on the bad list of a, of a mentor or a shop foreman. So, man, I, I know you're probably like tweaking out because it's your first week, but that's how everybody feels at their first week of any job, right? Think about the last job you got, and you're probably kind of stressed out in that first week. So take a step back, understand it's gonna be okay. You're probably doing a great job. I'm not there, so I can't be 100% sure, but based on the email you sent me, if that's what's happening, you're doing a really good job. This is a slow process. You are not going to be a 60 hour a week technician in week two when you just start out, right? Don't worry about your speed. Do the job right every single time. Don't worry about the shortcuts. Follow the repair manual step by step by step for the first time and probably the second time. By the third time, okay, maybe you don't need to take this piece off. Maybe you can you know, massage that part out without taking the component next to it off. So many guys look around the shop and go, man, that guy turned 80 hours. I'm, I'm not fast enough, right? Well, that guy's probably been doing it for 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, five years, and it's probably done those jobs a thousand times. Do not worry about doing jobs fast. I can't stress that enough. That is one of the things that gets technicians in their, early in their career in the most trouble is trying to do things fast rather than slow and correct. If you don't have time to do it slow once, you're not gonna have time to do it a second or third or fourth time. Speed comes later. Speed comes with practice and repetition and buying good quality tools that are maybe designed to do things a little bit faster. So, dude, take a breath. Enjoy the fact that you're at a really cool spot in your career. You got a good mentor, it sounds like. Hopefully you got a good shop you're working at. Make your list of tools, keep taking notes, keep taking pictures. When you get a diagnosis, write down a little summary in a notebook so that you have that. I really, one of the biggest regrets I have in my career is not doing that, not documenting the diagnostic process I did on jobs early in my career, because boy, what would a notebook like that really have been worth throughout my career? All right, last one of the day comes from Ed. This is on an Audi A4 1998 2.8 liter V6. I'm having trouble with the engine. It will idle fine, revs up to about 1200 RPM, then nothing. Picks back up around 2200 RPM, has no power no matter the RPM. I changed the plugs, wires, air filter, and have a fuel filter I need to install. I did the basics and nothing changed. Any help would be great. Thanks, Ed. Okay, Ed, Um, I don't know. I'm gonna just be right up front. Here's what we need to do. Very first thing we need to do is we need to check faults. Right now, there's some of the old timers out there like, these damn technicians can't fix anything today without checking faults. Well, why wouldn't you check faults, right? The computer's giving you information. It's foolish not to capitalize on that information. Ed, I'm gonna guess, go out on a limb a bit, and guess you have a check engine light on on this car, and if the check engine light's not on, I'm gonna almost guarantee that you have some kind of fault stored. There's a pretty good amount of things that could be wrong with this car. I have seen everything from a bad throttle body to a vacuum leak cause this kind of issue, similar issue. Uh, fuel filter, definitely. Even bad fuel can cause something like this. Timing not being correct can cause something like this. There is a number of things that could be causing this issue. Airflow meters are another one. So if I got this car in my bay, what would be my process? First thing I would do is check faults and go from there, right? If I have faults, I'm gonna focus on those systems that I have a fault stored for. Maybe it's the throttle body, maybe it's a idle higher RPM than expected or an intake system leak or an oxygen sensor fault. Whatever system had the fault, I would start there. I would probably do a thorough visual inspection on it, make sure we don't have any exhaust leaks, air leaks, that kind of thing. The next thing I would do, let's say we didn't have any faults, just hit the throttle, nothing really happens, car has no power. We need to really evaluate, is this an engine problem or is this a transmission problem? This could easily be, you know, when you say no power, what does that mean? And this is where I think a lot of the frustration in the automotive industry comes from, is if even if you brought this to a VW dealership or the best, you know, independent VW Audi shop in the world, it, I said VW dealership, Audi dealership, whatever, it doesn't matter. The, you're gonna go in, you're gonna talk to an advisor, you're gonna say exactly what you said to me in this email. About 10% of that's probably gonna get back to the technician. So what does no power mean? Does that mean when I hit the throttle, the RPM doesn't change? 
Or does that mean when I put the car in drive and I hit the throttle, the car doesn't go? Now, does it not go as it should? Or does it not move at all, right? These are all things we need to evaluate. Now, you threw a bunch of parts on this car and I'm actually not even upset that you did that because those are maintenance things and those probably needed to be replaced anyway. So first thing, we need check faults, visual inspection. Then we need to determine why it doesn't have power, obviously, and where it doesn't have power from. Is it engine or transmission? Does it not go forward, but goes backwards normally? Okay, we probably have a transmission issue. Does it not move at all under its own power? Could be engine, could be transmission. Unfortunately, Ed, this is not enough information to really give you a whole lot to do your on your own, other than tell you, check the faults. If you don't have a scan tool, guys, I, I really think today, every DIYer, if you're gonna be serious about DIY, beyond changing your own oil, and even, even that, you know, on a lot of cars, you kind of need a scan tool to reset maintenance lights. But if you're gonna be doing things other than air filters and that kind of stuff, you gotta have a scan tool. One thing I would probably try is disconnecting the airflow meter and seeing what happens. Of course, check engine lights come out, gonna come on. It may really make the car mad. I don't know. The 98 generation in the VW world anyway was a very strange world because some cars would do stuff okay when you did things like unplug the math. Others would get really, really upset. After you do your basic visual inspections, make sure you don't have any vacuum leaks, make sure your fuel is good, that kind of stuff. I really think it's probably best to take this in and get it properly evaluated. What I don't want you to do is spend a ton of money throwing parts at the car, all to not fix it, and then have to take it in anyway and pay a $100 diagnostic fee. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to try and fight through a problem on your own uh, with a vehicle. Sometimes it makes sense just pay the $100, $120 and get it properly diagnosed, that can, believe it or not, actually save you money in the long run. So, Ed, I, I'm not gonna be a ton of help here, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, I just, I don't wanna tell you, hey, do these things and it'll fix your car, because there's no way for me to know that. But I really highly recommend get the faults checked first before you do anything else beyond a visual inspection, because that's probably gonna point you in the right direction, or at least point you in a direction, even if it points you in the wrong direction, that's one less system you're gonna have to worry about having a problem. All right guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions or comments, you know what to do. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button. Always appreciate that. Don't forget to subscribe right here on YouTube or if you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher or wherever you're listening, really. With that, I am out. Guys, have an awesome day. Thank you for watching or thank you for listening and I'll talk to you again next time.